Amen. So I found this Bible verse in uh, Second <laughs> Second Chronicles thirteen five. Examine yourself to see if you are really in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Interesting. I guess basically it's saying if Jesus is in you, something ought to be happening. And that's where I want to go tonight. It's something happening. You know, I was so powerfully moved by Bill's sermon last week. It was just amazing. Um, John 14, 12. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I go to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, this sounds like a wonderful passage. The problem is the context is Jesus is trying to comfort the disciples because they're mourning the fact that he just told them, I'm going to leave you. And not only did he say, I'm going to leave you, he said, one of you is going to deny me, another of you is going to betray me, and all of you are going to fall away. So this is not a positive conversation. And this is when Jesus says, greater works will you do. And by the way, all the disciples went forth, and they did incredible miracles. Every one of them raised the dead. Um, It was just the continuation of of what Jesus did. And here's the problem. We read this, and are we seeing any of those works? Are we seeing any of those works far less greater works? You know, I heard a pastor balk about miracles. Miracles. I've never seen a miracle happen. And I I felt like going, wow, I mean, I see miracles a lot. I do, you know, and I feel like you're supposed to be in the place spiritually. That's what's available through you because you're connected to the living God who's the risen Savior. So something's supposed to be happening. Do you not realize that Christ is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? Jesus goes on to say, whatever we ask of him, we will do. Well, first of all, we don't see anything happening. And second of all, how many times have we asked for something to happen and it doesn't occur? Now, the health and wealth preachers will use this verse to teach people if you, you, you name it, you claim it in prayer, and it's going to come about. And I don't mind telling you, I've tried it. Yeah. All right. You know, and if you put enough money down and all that stuff and, you know, heal my cancer, provide my home and car. And by the way, nice ones. And, and I want you to know that I've, I've prayed for healing from cancer and received it. I've prayed for homes and received them. I've prayed for cars and received them. Okay? It happens. It it, it happens. But a lot of times cancer doesn't go away. You don't get the material wealth. And and then you're left with people wagging the finger of blame at you. Well, that's because you didn't ask in faith. Okay? And so it gets a little heavy duty when Jesus makes a power statement and, and, and we're confused. So what about these greater works? How can I do greater things than Jesus did? Heal the blind and the lame, raise the dead back to life, control nature, stop storms. Well, first of all, we can do these things when we lay hands on people and pray in faith. Not every time is it going to happen. Okay? Um, It happens, though. There's, I don't know how, I don't want to see your hands, but there's a lot of people here who have seen miracles, okay? You've seen them, and you know people who've had powerful miracles happen. It happens all across the globe, all the time. And friends, Jesus is the head of the church, and as his disciples, we're to carry on the works he did. 
You see in Acts that Jesus' continuation of ministry just kept flowing through the apostles in the early church. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And and this is one of the key ingredients to understanding greater works. It's the Holy Spirit released through you. And, and, And here's the power of it. Jesus no longer has to be physically present with you anymore. Remember in John 11 when the pastor was preaching on Sunday with the big arms, okay? If you were here. Okay, I've been in the gym every day since, you know. (laughs) Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. See, what's the problem? Needed Jesus to be there. Well, guess what? Doesn't need to be there anymore. It's to your advantage that I go away so I can release the comforter, the Holy Spirit, who will now be with you at all times. You used to be with Jesus when he was in the same room, but if we went down the hallway, you didn't have Jesus anymore. Now you have the Holy Spirit. You always have Jesus. This is very important. And and, and so Jesus sums up his ministry. I I, I like the way Bill said it last week. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which you gave me to do. The work he did was to bring glory to God. And so if you and I are to follow in the works of Jesus... We're supposed to be demonstrating the Father's love and mercy. We're supposed to be confronting the religious errors of the day. Jesus was confronting the religious errors of the day. The Pharisees had it wrong. So amazing that you can have the Bible memorized like experts and miss the point. And they really did. And, and, and you know, I like what Bill says. He wants to rebrand God for our society today, 2018. Instead of a God of judgment to, and fear to a God of love and grace. And, and this, is, this is our greater work, friends. And, and you say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. What about all those judgment passages? Well, let's just listen to what Jesus says. I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. John three seventeen. So there sums up all of your judgment passages. It's not his point, his purpose. He came to judge sin. And one clue to Jesus' statement, greater works, is because I'm going to go to the Father. You know, a couple things happened when Jesus went to the Father. Two things we know of in the Bible. One, he intercedes on our behalf. And I want you to feel this physically. You have a problem, and you lift up a prayer, and Jesus steps in to intercede on your behalf. I want you to lift up your problem right now and realize that Jesus is with God right now interceding on your behalf. Remember when he prayed for Peter? He knew Peter was going to deny him. Satan wanted to sift him like wheat. And Jesus says, I prayed for you. Okay? So that was not the end of Peter. There's something else that Jesus does. He, he prays for us. Do you ever pray for somebody all the time? If you're like me, you pray for your children, you pray for your church, you pray for your best friends. You, you know, you, there are certain people that you pray for all the time. And you are on Jesus' prayer list. Now that's kind of a big deal. So you got Jesus, God the Son, sitting next to God the Father, releasing God the Spirit through intercession and prayer for you. I mean, that's a lot of power coming your way. Okay? So, greater works that the disciples do is a direct result of Jesus releasing his power into your life through the Holy Spirit right now. And again, the question is, if we have the Holy Spirit, why isn't there greater works taking place? You know, John Wimber was the founder of the Vineyard Fellowship, and I used to be connected to the the Vineyard Fellowship with John Wimber, and so John Wimber was doing miracles all the time. The miraculous stuff, healing people and, you know, all that stuff. And and so... uh, He would say, miracles every day. And and long before I was ever connected to John Wimber, I had noticed 
that when I read my Bible every day, and I prayed for the Lord to show up, and I went forward with the intention of sharing Jesus some way, somehow, somewhere, whether it be through my mouth, whether it be through my actions, whether it be whatever, Jesus was the agenda. Miracles happened every day. Now, I mean, sometimes it was a big deal, you know, a healing. A lot of times it was a prompting that was unnatural, and I was led to talk to somebody. Sometimes it was an interaction after an hour of prayer where the Lord came off the page and something. But I'm telling you that it was, you lived in a spiritual zone. And it, it, it's just, it's the coolest experience you can have as a Christian. And the real world gets in the way and, you know, you got to try to bring the spiritual self into the real world and let that be the way you live. And I'm telling you, it's a whole different experience than most people understand, okay? Uh, I remember one pastor dismissed John Wimber's claims of daily miracles because, well, John Wimber's best friend died from cancer. I didn't see a miracle there. In fact, John Wimber died when he was in his 60s. No miracle there. And I go, well, you, you know, everybody dies, right? And when you're a Christian, to live is Christ and to die is gain, Okay? That's what, you know, I was thinking about all these Christians that are getting martyred in the mi Middle East. And do you notice how they all try to witness to their, their killers and, you know, they're all at peace and other people are so amazed by their peace that they say, yeah, I'm with that guy's God, you know, and yeah, because they have a relationship with God and to, they just know that there's something amazing waiting for us. You know, a lot of times in the academic world, we'll take all the miracles and we'll put them into clusters. <clears throat> you know, when God's word needed to be authenticated, like in Exodus, when Moses was liberating the people and, and forming the nation of Israel, Moses did a whole bunch of miracles. And then when Elijah and Elisha were keeping Israel from falling completely into Baal worship, Elijah and Elisha did a whole bunch of, of, of miracles. Then, of course, you know, Daniel, he was in a miracle time, and, and then, you know, Jesus and the apostles, and then it was over. Okay. Well, the problem with this statement is, you know, I was reading um, Joshua earlier in the week, and there was a whole bunch of miracles taking place. This is after Moses, and I was reading Judges yesterday, and there was a whole bunch of miracles, and I just read the whole entire Bible in 2017, and it's kind of a funny thing. This is always the movement of God all the time in people's lives. And so to try to, to try to castigate miracles as just a periodic thing that God does every once in a while is to not understand walking with God and giving him access to your life and, and, and enjoying that amazing experience. I remember being at seminary and the professor said, you know, <clears throat> There are no more miracles. You know, and on Tuesday, the Lord had just done a miracle through me, you know. So I'm going, wow. So you're telling me it's possible to be biblically smart and spiritually ignorant. It's kind of, kind of confusing. You know, you go to seminary to become a man of God, and you realize um, it's not that you have read something different than I have. It's just that I just saw God do something that you said can't happen. And so now I don't trust you as my professor. And you don't say that because you want to get a good grade, okay? You don't have to be academically stupid, you know. I liked it when Bill pointed out last week, Gideon says, where are the miracles you used to do Then we heard about? And then what happens? The miracles happen to Gideon. All you had to do was ask, where are the miracles? You know, I was restoring my last church. It was a broken church. It was a mess. It was divided, and they were fighting with each other, and, you know, they hated each other, and, and it was all bad, you know. And so, you know, the Lord was punishing me, and he sent me to that church. And uh, it's amazing ministry. You know, I, I talked to them about grace, and people said, we've never heard about grace before. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, the last pastor talked about the Civil War. And kind of, I just thought about this, and that was what happened, right? A civil war happened in the church, you know? Talked about the Holy Spirit. We never heard of the Holy Spirit. 
I made Jesus the, the focal point of the ministry, and we went from being the worst church in our Presbyterian in town to being one of the best churches in our Presbyterian in town. And it was about year three, I, I realized, you know, <clears throat> I'm kind of used to miracles, and I'm seeing this incredible transformation of the church, but I, I, I miss the miracles. Lord, I miss miracles. Guess what starts happening? Little miracles. And then he reminded me, my very first day on the job. I walk in, it's seven in the morning. I walk in, and we had like a little narthex like out there that we have here. And, and, and right up here was an evil presence. I'm like, oh. And you know, was, there's an evil presence there. Told him there was a new sheriff in town, and I cast him out, and I walked this entire campus. Seven in the morning, nobody else was around just claimed the whole place for, for the Lord Jesus, and the next thing you know, cool ministry. And, you know, I'm, and I'm not one of those guys that sees demons, you know, less than, you know, I'm casting out demons is like five times in my life. It's not a normal occurrence. And, and, and so here's the deal. And my point is, if you ask God to move, and you step forth to bring God glory, and you spread his word, and you give God access to your life, he is going to show up. I just need you to hear me. If you ask him to show, if you step forward in his name in any way, shape, or form, he's going to show up. You don't even have to get the right words when you talk about Jesus. You cannot get your theology straight, and you just know that God loves you. He wants to be part of your life, and he'll straighten out your theology. And he'll teach you the right words. But it's about your heart wanting him to show up. I liked it when Paul had handkerchiefs and aprons carried to the sick and they were healed and demons were gone and diseases were, were, you know, removed. But then something weird happens. Paul tells Timothy to drink a little wine for his frequent stomach problems. Why didn't he say, lay hands on your tummy and pray in faith and get healed? Or, or another time in, in, in 1 Timothy... 420, he says, Trophimus, I left sick at Miletus. Well, he's been doing amazing work with Paul. Why didn't Paul heal him and bring him? Why did he leave him sick? So, the point is, sometimes God moves this way. Sometimes God moves that way. We don't know. We do know he moves. Okay? And, and we just have to know this. At times, God does a miracle because he wants to authenticate the message that's being preached. Sometimes, God does a miracle just because you need one. And I don't know what, you know, you just know that he can move, you know that he likes you, you know that he wants to save souls. So you walk forward in faith and let him be the one who decides what's going to happen. But here's the most important thing I'm going to say tonight. Miracles are not the goal. When you become a miracle chaser, it's the whole wrong way of doing things. Bringing God glory is the purpose of the miracle, of our faith, of the Word of God, of the church, okay? It's not about doing miracles. I think that sometimes we read this passage and we assume the greater works are going to be the miracles. And there's a greater work than that. The greater work has to deal with Jesus' death on the cross for your sins and resurrection, which means you're going to have eternal life with him. The greater work is the power of the gospel to transform lives. The fact that God can come into the natural person and change our inclination to sin and selfishness and turn us to desire to bring God glory and be no longer under the domination of sin. Now that's the greater work. Let me get practical with you. An alcoholic accepted Jesus and he quits drinking and his buddies started in on him. Well, didn't Jesus turn the water into wine? He goes, yeah, I heard about that. And all I know is that he turned beer into furniture in my house, okay? 
See, we get different values. You know, I was thinking about this. Jesus preached, you know, he fed the 5,000, and what happened? A whole bunch of people left, right? Quit following him. Peter preaches, to three, and 3,000 get converted, right? So what's going on? Well, I'm not comparing the two. You can't compare a human to God. But I, I am saying this. Peter preached under the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit, pointing everybody to what Jesus Christ had done for them. And the Holy Spirit was released. And whether you're preaching or whether you're in a conversation at the Starbucks over a table or you're writing a text, if you bathe it in prayer, guess what? You don't know what's going to happen. But you know this. You have activated it spiritually. And now it's become God's territory. And, you know, in terms of greater works, the apostles preached in Galilee and Jerusalem, and, and, and then uh, some of the other guys left, and they went to uh, Rome, and they basically preached the gospel and took over the world. There are billions of Christians that have existed now. So, you know, kind of a big deal. And I want to say this, there's no greater work possible than the conversion of a soul. If I heal your body, you're still going to die. I introduce you to Jesus, you're going to live forever eternally. It's a greater work. Okay? The Christians in Rome, they went about caring for the plague victims. They went about feeding the poor. They went about, you know, loving people that everybody else rejected. Took over Rome. All right? And so I guess as the Lord uses us to spread the good news of Christ's death for our sins and resurrection, okay, that we're going to live forever with him, this is the greater, it's the new covenant versus the old covenant. Remember what, you know, um, Jesus, he told the, the people that those who are least in the kingdom of God are greater than John the Baptist, the greatest of the old covenant. See, the new covenant is a greater thing. It's, it's, it's you have the presence of God with you at all time. And herein lies the secret. Greater things you will do because Jesus is with us. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Do you realize that Jesus is in you? He's the source within us. Christianity is not a formula. It's not a theory. It's not a philosophy. It's not even a lifestyle. It's the indwelling presence of God. That's what Christianity is. It's not comparable to other religions. This is God Almighty not only reaching out to us and saying, hey, here's a, here's a way to eternal life, but infiltrating us so that even our sinfulness can't get in the way of our relationship with him. Don't think that I'm putting sinfulness, making it easy. Sinfulness minimizes the presence of God. It messes things up. He came to get rid of that stuff. But there is nothing that can remove you from his hand once that, that relationship gets started. So, I guess I want to ask you a really hard question. Are you seeing anything happen in your life? Because if you don't have God movements, God moments, divine encounters, maybe you haven't because you have not embraced the message of Christianity. Okay? See, we're saved by grace. And grace is a free gift. It's not something that you do. It's not something that you earn. It's a free gift that you accept. You know, all the other religions of the world try to earn access to God's favor. If you do this set of behaviors, you're going to gain access. And the problem is this. Whenever sin is present, it nullifies our efforts. James 2.10 says, if you keep all the rules except for one, then you're disqualified because the perfection that, that, that is required to please God is a standard that sin disqualifies us from. Okay? And this is a unique message. I think it's why the world rejects it because it just couldn't be that easy that God anticipated the negative results of sin's devastation and stepped in personally to do something about it on our behalf 
sending Jesus, the one who created the world. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning. That one is the one who went to the cross for us. This is the amazing grace, the incredible love of God made available, the fact that God Almighty wants to have a relationship with you. Show me your glory. And he said, all right, I'll get close to you. You know, we don't want him to get close because, you know, <clears throat> he gets close, he's going to see how sinful we are. He already knew that. He sent Jesus. See, you don't have to avoid a relationship with God because of your sinfulness because he already took care of the sinfulness. And it's not until you get into the presence of God that your sinfulness is going to dissipate. You can't get yourself right enough to be able to have access to God. You just get into his presence. And that's how it works. I think one of the greater miracles is that we no longer see ourselves as the center of the universe. We now understand that God is the focus of why we live. It's almost like the original sin has been rectified. God's restored back to his throne. This is a greater work. Because there was no other way to tame the human broken soul. And, and really, friends, this greater works that we do, I think it means that you and I are the distributors of the message of grace. You know, I found this unique passage in John 20, 23. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. <coughs> well, if you're like me, I immediately got out a pencil. And there's a few people that came to mind. not forgiven. I have the ability. No. We're supposed to love as he loved. And if I remember correctly, when he was on the cross, he said about the people who were crucifying him, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So guess what? You don't get to excommunicate anybody. But you know what? There's a little bit of freedom in that. I don't have to be bothered by their bad behavior. I get to take the love of Jesus Christ and apply it to everybody that I don't like. And I've had to do this recently. You know, the ISIS thing has really bothered me over the last few years. It really bothered my soul a lot. And I thought, boy, if I saw someone walking down the street with the nicest flag, you know, you know, and then the Lord and I have to get into an argument. You know, and it's good to let him win arguments, by the way. They know not what they do. And me doing violence to somebody who's about violence is not going to show the love of God. All right? And I don't have to really worry about violence because, you know, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So, you're not allowed to withhold forgiveness from anybody. So, let's take that somewhere. Do you have somebody in your life? I know you do. You need to just rectify the forgiveness issue. You know, Bill and I were talking in my office. There's this passage that says, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And if you and I bind the grace of God, brought down to earth from heaven, guess what? We now live in the same state of mind, spirit, and power of Jesus Christ. And if we loose on earth what's been loosed in heaven, what's been loosed in heaven? Um, mercy and grace and forgiveness, the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace. Okay? Okay. Wow. Do you see the greater things that are taking place? Because, you know, I was, I was looking at the news today on MSN. And that is a really a downer. Everybody hates everybody. You know, and I mean, I'm not even going to get into it. It's, you know, this, that, and the, it's all bad. And uh, you can enjoy a, a better life than you presently are right now by choosing the greater things, which is the relationship with God that's been made available. You know, Jesus restored what was lost in Eden. 
Remember when Adam and Eve could walk in the cool of the garden with God? Huh. You get to walk in the cool of his garden, of his presence. It's a big deal. It's beautiful. And, and it's possible that you're here and you've accepted what Jesus has done for you and you're saved for eternity. But you know what? There's more to be had right now. Maybe you haven't actualized his presence. You know, maybe you're still trying to earn it. I, I, it's amazing how Christians, you know, I, I mean, I even do it. Have I had my quiet time? Well, if I haven't, I'm going to have it later. Okay? And does it qualify me to do ministry? What qualifies me to do the ministry is the Lord told me, hey, go do the ministry. Okay? It's not about how good I am or how bad I am. Um, and and I, I want to say this. When we allow God to transform us and reach through us, greater things happen. And here's how it works. I want you to hear me. It's real easy. When a, the Spirit of God prompts you from within to reach out to somebody, somebody comes to mind, send them a text. Boom. The Lord brought you to mind today, and I covered you in prayer. Now, that email can go to just about anybody, enemies included. Okay? Um, some of us, God puts a stirring in our spirit that won't go away. I'm upset about human trafficking. And I run into somebody else who's upset about it. And we say, well, let's do something about it. And we don't know what to do. So we pray. And then we meet somebody that's connected to a source that knows how to do something about it. And the next thing you know, a ministry's born. Or maybe he's calling you. Have you ever been in that spot where you haven't read your Bible for a while and you haven't prayed for a while and you feel empty and you feel far from God and, 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 and you just, and it's almost like he's saying, hey, I miss you. Come back to me. Because you're never going to be happy distant from him. And it's sad because then all of a sudden something's not working and we go, hey, uh, Lord, um, can I have a, can I have a five? <laughs> Actually, I need a 20. Um, I need a miracle. I need... And what a bummer for him, because there could have been this ongoing friendship. And, and, and here's, here's there's the biggest problem. We see God as somebody to manipulate for our life. And, and the miracles actually are for us to bring glory to God. So do you see how we get out of whack? And if you're not in a prayer life, if you're not reading your Bible, if you're not staying connected, it's because, yeah, we've got it wrong, and we focused on the lesser, not the greater thing. I'm the center of the universe rather than God. Because he tells you, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. By the way, wherever you see the word righteousness, what makes us right with God? Jesus. So whenever you read the word righteousness in your Bible, just turn it into Jesus. Be surprised at how it always makes sense. Well, speaking of the power of Jesus, you know, this kid, he, he uh, <clears throat> goes shopping with his mom, and he, goes, and he sees the cookies. Mom, I want the cookies. No, you're not getting any cookies. Mom, I want the cookies. I told you you're not getting cookies. Mom, I want the cookies. You ask for the cookies again, you're going to get it. Stakes quiet for a few minutes. Then he says, in the name of Jesus, I asked for these cookies. Well, this lady goes, that's amazing. Your, your child, you've taught your child to lean on Jesus for any of his needs. And, and, and that's just an incredible theology. You're an amazing parent. I just want to commend you. And little boy went home with cookies. <laughs> and there's, you know, it's kind of fun. There's power in the name. It's my point. And, and, you know, there's power in the name. Not when you want cookies, but... When somebody's soul is on the line and when life's not working out and when death is a possibility and all those things that we fear, 
There is one name given to us by which we can be saved, and that's the name of Jesus. Okay? That's our name. That's our, that's our way. This is, when you pray in the name of Jesus, this is embracing his identity as God the Son, his salvation accomplished on the cross. It refers to all he is and all he's done. Okay? It, 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 you're, this is a big deal. Jesus tells us over and over, you ask and I'll answer. If, if you live in me and my word lives in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. Okay? If you are living with Jesus Christ's agenda in mind, you, you're just going to experience the most incredible journey. And if you're like me, there needs to be some realignment taking place right now. Okay. I got all this sermon and I'm done. It's too much sermon. <laughs> Here's the deal. There's no longer self. The greater things are God. There's no longer earthly concerns. It's heavenly concerns. You're no longer fear-based. You, you, you know, you, you, you are... Put into that place of trust. You're no longer working, you're resting. And friends, are you in that greater life? Because it's so easy to miss it. It's, it's, I got me here and I got God here and you just got to switch it out. Because this God is going to take care of everything going on in your life. That's the greater life. And that releases the greater works. And that's where eternal destinies are settled. And that is the greater work. Lord, we're here tonight because we love you. We know to call upon your name. We're even bold enough to ask to see your glory. And I ask, Father, that in 2018, it's going to be not my will, but thy will. It's going to be thy agenda. It's going to be your power, your presence, and just that amazing joy that I belong to God and whatever's going on, he promises to handle it, so I'm going to live in trust. I'm going to live in peace. I'm going to live with my spiritual purpose leading the way. And I'm going to be surprised when I look back and see the greater works that happen because I gave you access to my life. Lord, I pray for everybody here. I ask that there would truly be a Holy Spirit anointing on us, that you would just plow through any of the issues that we've got going on, any blocks, any worries, any fears, any whatevers, that you would establish Jesus Christ front and center, at the core of our being, that reminder always, this is the way. Walk with him whenever we turn to the right or to the left. And all God's people said, amen. Friends, we got communion for you over here. Okay? Judy's going to serve it. Charles is going to help. If you want some prayer, me and Bill are hanging out. Um, I just want you to have a wonderful weekend. Amen? Amen. I see the cloud I stare within I should.